my name is Susan Troller McKinstry. I'm a faculty member at Penn State in the Material Science and Engineering Department. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about work that my group has done over the years on piezoelectric films for microelectromechanical systems. I'm going to start out talking about what makes a material piezoelectric. And then I'm going to try and give you some examples of why these materials are fun and interesting. And so I'm going to give you examples of uh, use of their of these materials in energy harvesting systems, for adjustable optics, for miniaturized ultrasound transducers, and maybe even potentially for new materials for computer memory. And fundamentally, piezoelectric materials are materials that will convert between electrical and mechanical energies. And so as a result, I can apply electric fields to these materials and make useful devices out of them. And I'll try and give you examples of that as we go forward. To understand what causes piezoelectricity, it's useful thinking about the most important crystal structure for this application, which is the perovskite crystal structure. So you can imagine atoms like lead or barium sitting on the corners of the unit cell. They're the ones shown in green. The atom that's shown in red is the oxygen, or excuse me, is the titanium or zirconium atom. The atoms that are shown in blue are oxygen atoms. And you will notice that as we change temperature in this material, the whole shape of the unit cell distorts as the atom that should have been at the very beginning of the, the very center of the unit cell displaces from the center of the unit cell. So you can see that displacement there as that red atom moved up, the whole unit cell got long parallel to the titanium displacement and it shrank laterally. And that says that there will ultimately be a coupling between this atom displacement, which is going to be related to a spontaneous polarization and the shape of the material. And there are multiple possible ways these materials can distort. So if I start with an atom like this, where it had six equivalent oxygen atoms around, and I say that I wanna take that atom and move it close to one of its oxygen neighbors, well, clearly it could distort by moving up, down, forward, back, left, or right. And those different possibilities are going to produce different domains in much the same way that magnets have domains with it. In that case, the magnetic domains with north and south poles. Here, we're just going to say that the polarization is pointed in the same direction as the displacement of the positive charges. And I can have both domains. So here you see a domain where all of the titanium, say, would be displaced in a down direction. Here, they're all displaced off to the right. And the boundary between them is what we call a domain wall. And now if I look, how can I take this material and how can I make it change shape with an applied electric field? You can see that here. And I've shown this exaggerated for clarity, but you can see in this volume of material, all the titaniums were displaced in the up direction. And so I have a polarization in the up direction. When I apply an electric field in the up direction, the whole unit cell keeps getting taller and taller and skinnier and skinnier as I take that atom and move it further and further off the center of the unit cell. That change in the shape of the unit cell is one of the origins of what's called the intrinsic piezoelectric response. A second possible way of getting intrinsic piezoelectric response would be to take a material where say all of the titaniums were displaced towards one of the corners of the cube. So it's off at an angle. And if I apply an electric field in this direction, I'm gonna to try to rotate that polarization to line up with the applied electric field. And as it does so, the material is going to change shape. That's another contribution to the intrinsic piezoelectric coefficient, that polarization rotation. And um, 
Another possibility is what we're going to call the extrinsic contribution, where in this particular mechanism, I'm going to have domains with different orientations. And if I can move the boundary between those orientations with an applied electric field, the material will change shape. And you can see those two contributions animated here. So I'm showing them terribly exaggerated to make them easier to see. But the intrinsic piezoelectric effect, I'm going to change the shape of the unit cell with the applied electric field. The extrinsic piezoelectric effect, I'm going to move a domain wall around with an applied electric field. And those domain walls are crystallographic mistakes. And not terribly surprisingly, those crystallographic mistakes have to move through real defective materials. We can't make perfect materials. So there's always some concentration of defects around. And that turns out to be quite important because that means that if I consider the potential energy as a function of the position of the domain wall, I have a finite possibility that the domain walls are going to oscillate with an electric field at the bottom of a potential well that's really deep so that when I remove the electric field, we'll come back to the same starting position. Or if the wells are shallow enough, I can move between one potential well and the next. And if that happens, then I might not end up at exactly the same position when I'm done. And we will call that irreversible motion of domain walls. And this turns out to be quite important because that irreversible contribution of domain walls really increases the piezoelectric coefficient, but it also increases the amount of energy loss in the material. And if we think about bulk piezoelectric materials, they're the materials that are used to launch and receive sound waves and sonar systems or in medical ultrasound transducers. They're the same materials that are used for many, many buzzers and beepers. And all of us are carrying around, or at least the vast majority of us are carrying around thin film piezoelectric materials as well. And so the thin film piezoelectric that most of us carry around is the materials that are used in filters in cell phones. And this allows us, for example, to protect the receive electronics, which are relatively fragile and sensitive, from the transmit electronics that are putting out very high powers from our cell phones. And so we need filters that will, that will protect those, those receive electronics. Historically, the way that was done was to use a dielectric resonator. And the dielectric resonators were about half the size of my little finger. And they were made out of a nice high density ceramic and they only spoke on one frequency band. So think about a modern cell phone. We have many frequency bands because we have the 5G network that uses a pretty wide frequency range. And I needed one of those dielectric resonators for every frequency band. And so that rapidly became too heavy and uh, too large. And so a number of years ago, we replaced those dielectric resonators with teeny tiny devices that were based on thin film piezoelectrics, where we could basically oscillate that thin film in its thickness direction, and because there's a coupling between electrical and mechanical energies, that changed the electrical impedance, and I can use that for my filtering function. The key figure of merit for that application says, how efficiently can I convert between electrical and mechanical energy? That's that K squared term. And the quality factor of the resonator that says, if I start something ringing, how long will it ring? And I think all of us appreciate that if you strike a bell with an impulse, that bell will ring with many reverberations, will produce a very pure tone for a while. But if I take something with a lower quality factor like my hands and I provide an impulse, I get one immediate sound and then nothing that damped out very quickly. And so it's really the product of that conversion efficiency and the quality factor that describes how useful materials are. And aluminum nitride, kind of a terrible piezoelectric, but with a really high mechanical quality factor is the champion material for that application. 
But as I said, aluminum nitride has kind of a small piezoelectric coefficient. So my group has looked at applications that require much larger piezoelectric coefficients. These are for sensors, actuators, or energy harvesters, for example. And here, the key figure of merit always relates to what's called the E31 piezoelectric coefficient, which says if I apply an in-plane strain X, how much out-of-plane electrical response will I get? Or if I apply an out-of-plane electric field, how much in-plane stress can I generate? And we use this coefficient because we want to be able to amplify motion. So if you can imagine, if I start with a material that's not electro mechanically active, so it's going to be passive, and I put on top of it a piezoelectric material. Remember these piezoelectric materials, when you apply an electric field parallel to the polarization direction, they try to elongate vertically and contract laterally. And if it's on something that's not changing shape, the whole structure will bend like this. And we use that bending motion to amplify deflection to do that at low voltage. And there's all sorts of interesting things that we can do with that. And I'm going to walk through a couple of examples of those. The first is in the area of energy harvesting. And there's lots of reasons that this might be interesting. I'm showing here a little mechanical energy harvester on one of my student's fingers. And you can see that every time he moves his fingers, he gets a voltage pulse on the oscilloscope. So where might that be interesting? Well, there's a lot of places it might be interesting. Many of you may have heard of what's called the Internet of Things, where we're going to have all these distributed sensors placed around. Well, if we're going to have all these distributed sensors and they're electrical, we need to power all those distributed sensors. Where you can, you'll use solar power. Where you can't, we're going to need to scavenge power from some other source. And one of the most ubiquitous energy sources is vibrational energy. Most vibrational energy is at fairly low frequencies. And so if I make something thin, but I, you know, a thin film, that's gonna be my converter, that I want to have a low resonance frequency, well, I need to put it on a pretty thin support structure so it bends a lot. And I need to hang a heavy weight from the end. And when I do that, the power that I can get out will depend on this E31 coefficient squared divided by the relative permittivity. And so let's do a one on one comparison of that figure of merit for energy harvesters between a good piezoelectric like blood zirconate titanate, I'll call that PZT, and aluminum nitride, kind of bad piezoelectric. PZT has excellent piezoelectric properties, but a big dielectric constant. And that gives me a, a figure of merit of about 0.12 Coulomb squared per meter to the fourth. Tragically, aluminum nitride on silicon has a much weaker piezoelectric coefficient, but a very, very much smaller dielectric constant. And the figures of merit actually turn out to be essentially identical one to another. And that made me very sad because it felt like we should be able to do better with a better piezoelectric. And so our approach to doing better with a better piezoelectric is to recognize that all piezoelectric materials are anisotropic, and sometimes I can make that anisotropy work for me. And in particular, if you take a good piezoelectric like lead zirconate titanate and you put its polarization out of the plane and put electrodes on the top and bottom, that gives me the lowest dielectric constant and the biggest E31 coefficient. And calculations that we did said we should be able to go up about an order of magnitude in the figure of merit for energy harvesting. Well, that's big enough to go after. And so we tried to learn how to make materials that would give us this out of plane polarization. And the way we do that in practice, remember that the whole unit cell elongates parallel to the polarization and it shrinks laterally. So if we wanna force the polarization out of the plane, we squeeze it in the plane. 
by using a thermal expansion coefficient mismatch. And when we do that, we can grow thin films and they really do give you pretty much that full order of magnitude increase in the electrical conversion um, from mechanical to electrical energies. Very cool. So let's try now to take these interesting materials and make an energy harvester out of them. Well, tragically, the way that we did this was to grow on single crystal oxide or fluoride substrates. And when we make really thin structures out of those and hang a heavy weight on them, and now we oscillate them, they tend to break right at the root of the cantilever. And so they work great one time. And that made us very, very unhappy. And so we looked at, well, what can we do if we want to have something that's going to be able to oscillate a really, really long time without fracture, but still gives us the out of plane polarization we want. Well, all we really need is a difference in thermal expansion coefficient. And it turns out many metals really have very interesting properties for that application. They're mechanically robust. They don't fail by fracture in most cases and they have kind of high thermal expansion coefficients. And so we learned how to grow these lead zirconate titanate films either by chemical solution deposition or sputtering. We will take some trade down in the figure of merit for energy harvesting, but we can make really good energy harvesters out of them. And so that's what you see here, that, that piece that's flapping back and forth, that's a metal foil, which is coated with about three microns worth of lead zirconate titanate on either side. And working with a faculty member in the mechanical engineering department, we were able to decide that what you really want is to take the entire foil and bend it into a perfect parabola. And you can see we've kind of got a pretty nice looking parabola there because there's actually three hinges in that structure. And that's much better than a cantilever which tends to concentrate all the stress right near the anchor point for the cantilever. And this material is not so effective for energy harvesting. And that combination of a really good material and a really good mechanical design leads to the best performance for energy harvesting, vibrational energy harvesters that have been reported to date. And that is really interesting for powering distributed sensors for the internet of the thing, things. We've also made versions that you can wear on your wrist that, taste, wrist that take the motion of the human wrist and convert a small fraction of that energy to electrical energy to run health monitoring systems. The next thing I wanted to talk about is use of these thin films in actuator arrays. And here we're working very closely with colleagues in the electrical engineering department, Tom Jackson's group in particular, as well as colleagues from the Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics uh, that's at Harvard. And here we're trying to use piezoelectric materials to do things like understand the origin of the universe, which sounds kind of crazy and it's kind of fun to be involved in a crazy project like that. But the logic behind this is as follows. One of the sources of information about the early galaxies is x-rays from that are um, available in the universe. And the x-ray astronomy community wants to be able to take those x-rays that are coming in from very far distant portions of the universe, focus them onto a camera, and then detect them. Well, in practice, the way you focus an x-ray is by taking a curved surface with a very precise shape and reflecting the x-ray from that curved surface. It's critical that that curved surface have a very precise shape. And the way that was done when they launched the Chandra X-ray te telescope was to take cylinders of glass that are about a meter in diameter, they're quite tall as well, and they were very, very thick. They ranged from about one and a half centimeters to, to over an inch in thickness so that they would be stiff enough that they would maintain the desired shape. The problem is that much glass was really, really heavy. And so 
if we're going to be able to investigate fainter sources, we need to have many, many more reflective surfaces, which means that the actual glass has to be very much thinner. And the problem is anytime I make anything thin, it becomes quite flexible. And so they basically said, we need to have an absolutely precise figure on this piece of glass. You cannot touch this backside. That's where we're gonna put our mirror coating. Can you please put an array of actuators on the other side of the glass so that if there's any problems with the surface figure, we can apply an electric field to that region of the glass and we can make it change shape. And oh, by the way, we want a lot of this adjustable optic. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think of this program as kind of the, the moral error to the correctors that were used in the Hubble Space Telescope to restore the performance of the optical system on that device. That technology also ultimately arose from a Penn State project. And I'm hoping if the Lynx telescope flies that it will be allow adjustable optics into a next generation where again, Penn State personnel have been strongly involved. So like, how hard can this be? Well, it can be really hard. We had to totally adapt all of the deposition procedures that we use to grow these thin films to keep from distorting the glass too much um, due to the deposition. But what we found was that you could deposit piezoelectric layers onto the glass substrate. We could deposit an array of electrodes on those materials, and we can change the shape of the glass locally by applying electric fields to the individual pixels on these array. And you can see this is basically how much we're changing the surface of the, of the glass as we actuate three individual pixels on the, on the mirror. And so this is what one of the mirrors looks like in a flight-like mount. So this is close to what it would look like if it were gonna fly up in space. There would be many, many of these stacked to make um, basically the equivalent of a cylinder out of cylinder pieces. And you can see there's the beauty side of the mirror. That's where the x-rays reflect. And on the back, if you look very carefully, you can see a series of rectangles that correspond to individual piezoelectric cells. And we've taken that device and we've demonstrated that even in a university laboratory, you can make every single one of those piezoelectric cells work. And we are super proud of that. And so what you see is what's called the influence function measurement for every single one of those cells. This device works. It can take a distorted piece of glass and correct the surface to within a few nanometers. And that's adequate to achieve the desired performance for the Lynx X-ray Space Telescope. And now we have another problem. So great, this works on an individual mirror segment. Let's just imagine scaling this up. Well, even if I took just a single mirror segment that had a 40 by 40 array of pixels, now that means I need 1601 electrical contacts. And when we started the program, they literally glued one wire to each contact. And that just sounds like a nightmare. So we've switched to you know, the cleverer technology that they use to make all of the contacts for displays. And here, working with my collaborators at Penn State, made an enormous difference. And so Tom Jackson suggested, well, that sounds like a nightmare. What if you used row column addressing where you put a pixel, which has a, a thin, you put a thin film transistor on every single one of those pixels to hold the voltage that you want. And if you can do that, you can reduce the required number of electrical contacts to 81, far, far more tractable. And so we've learned how to do exactly that. We've learned how to grow zinc oxide thin film transistors, very similar to the ones that are used in some commercial displays, but now we grow them on actuator arrays and they work. And so it's beautiful that we're able to take transistors that turn on and off. We can utilize that to enable a much smaller number of electrical contacts. So now all of the electrical contacts for this entire mirror segment 
are running off those too thin ribbon cables. I think this technology is going to be generically really appealing for lots of applications, including the next one I'm gonna talk about, which is piezoelectric micromachined ultrasound transducers. So piezoelectric materials are already the material of choice for medical ultrasound transducers. What we'd really like to be able to do is to make much, much smaller transducer elements. And one way that we could do that is to put a thin piezoelectric film on a bending substrate. And then we're gonna basically just run this like a drum head. I'm not gonna talk through the details about how we make this, but we can end up building transducer arrays on things that are small enough that you could imagine putting this entire imaging system in a pill and swallowing it to do investigation of the gastrointestinal tract. And we in fact have been able to demonstrate imaging. So my student built the first one of these and he said, I don't know if my imaging is going to work. So I will make a heart and a broken heart. And depending on how good um, his imaging was going to be, he would decide whether he was happy or sad. And you can see here's the ultrasound image from our first attempt and it works. This is very, very cool. We can imagine doing all sorts of miniaturized ultrasound transducers to allow us to do body cavity based imaging. We've also looked at using these same materials to control the motion of particles on surfaces. This is not our idea originally. There'd been pre existing work that I'm showing here. Um, based on a related technology, a capacitive micromachined ultrasound transducer. And you can see that in that particular case, they got all the particles to line up on top of their actuating elements. And we demonstrated that we should be able to, based on modeling, do something similar with a piezoelectric device. And the advantage to the piezoelectric devices is that the motions are really large and we are able to do fully deterministic control of particles in fluids above the transducers. And you can see examples of that here where we've done it with both single elements where we turn the elements on and off. That's what we're going to call activation. Um, and when they're off, the particles tend to go towards the elements that are on. So where might this be important? probably the principal use in the end will be for applications like medical technologies where you need to be able to sort, for example, non-cancerous cells from cancerous cells if you're doing a medical diagnostic technique. And so we're currently trying to increase our resolution to see whether in fact we can achieve that level of cell sorting. The final application I wanna talk about is ferroelectric materials for memory applications. And part of the reason that we're interested in this is really motivated by this plot. Many of you may have heard of Moore's Law. Moore's Law says we're making more and more and more tinier, tinier transistors on every integrated circuit we use. And we've worked very hard over almost 50 years now to be able to continually miniaturize our computers, the chips, the, the transistors that go into the chips in our computers so that we can do more and more aggressive computation. However, in about 2003, we quit scaling frequency on these devices. And that's really associated with a desire not to make the computers may take up any more energy. And this is kind of a big deal because if you look at the current energy costs for the United States, we estimate, um, well, other people have estimated and we, we um, utilize this, um, that about five to 15% of worldwide energy com consumption is associated with computing. And US data centers alone consumed 73 billion kilowatt hours in 2020. These numbers are only expected to grow. We don't know how fast they'll grow, but they will certainly, they're anticipated to grow. So if you think, well, how can a material scientist maybe make a difference for global climate? 
change. Well, if we could reduce the cost of computation, maybe that would produce a big difference. And so we're starting to tackle this problem. And we're doing that by looking at the energy cost associated with the way we currently do computing, which is to have our logic processor physically separated from memory. And because there's only a few interconnections between those two, we actually spend up to 80% of our energy budget in computing, getting information back and forth between the processor uh, and memory or between uh, different processors. So what we really want to do is to radically increase the connection between memory and logic so we can significantly reduce the energy burden associated with computation. And so to do that, what we really need to do is to take all this memory and put it right on top of the logic uh, chip so that we densely interconnect the memory and logic. And there's really, really exciting new material science that's really quite recent. In some case, this, this first publication of ferroelectricity and aluminum scandium nitride is literally at this point two years old. And they demonstrated that you could have a beautiful ferroelectric hysteresis loop when you scandium dope aluminum nitride. We've recently demonstrated that these materials have fantastic temperature stability of the remnant polarization, the coercive fields, which are too large at room temperature, drop a lot as you heat them up. They look very exciting for potentially higher temperature um, memory and logic devices. We were able to demonstrate that there's no way that these things switch by an intrinsic switching mechanism because the the coefficients you would get from that are totally unphysical. Instead, what we see is the strong thermal activation of the uh, behavior so that we see roughly a 30 milli electron volt energy cost associated with the polarization reversal. And related to that is the fact that when we very first get these films, a lot of times, they, they look like a linear dielectric the first time you try them. And it's not till you cycle them a bunch of times that the hysteresis loop really looks quite beautiful. That process is called wake up. And one of the things that my group is studying now is what's the mechanism by which these materials reorient their polarization. I've animated here my best guess as to how it happens. And we're currently trying to sort through all of the required experimental information to figure out whether this guess is a reasonable guess or not. But my guess is that this material inverts by taking the puckered hexagonal ring that's characteristic of the wurtzite crystal structure and inverting the pucker. The key challenge we're facing here is if you look at how far I have to move an atom from the pucker up to the pucker down position, it's pretty far, it's about, it's about an angstrom. What we'd really like to be able to do is to drop that about a factor of, well, at least in half is my guess, so that we can reduce the coercive fields. And if we can do that, we have a material that's compatible with back end of the line process technology temperatures that we think shows very, very interesting performance for these integrated memory devices. And we've studied the fundamental physics that's guiding that. What we think we're seeing is as we cycle these materials and we wake them up, we see the reversible dielectric constant go up. We think this is from that reversible motion of domain walls that I talked about at the very beginning of the presentation. This increase in slope we think is due to irreversible motion of domain walls. And now we're in the process of trying to prove all of that, to prove that proposed mechanism. Also worked very closely with one of my collaborators in material science and engineering, Professor John Paul Maria, who found this elegant paper that says, well, what should the energy cost for switching a polarization be for these Wurtzite structured compounds? And he identified zinc oxide as one that ought to have a small energy cost. And sure enough, when he grew it, he has a beautiful ferroelectric hysteresis loop with much smaller coercive fields than we see in some of the nitride analogs. 
And we're now pursuing this really aggressively for the potential for three-dimensional ferroelectric microelectronics. So to conclude, hopefully what I've done is to say, sometimes you can do really interesting material science. You can be a specialist in piezoelectric or ferroelectric materials. You can take your basic knowledge of the structure property relations that govern the functional performance of those materials in a wide range of applications ranging from um, cell phone filters, to energy harvesting devices, to actuator arrays, to potentially um, new materials for computation and for computer memory. So with that, I thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs>